Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we have with us today Mr. Grant Tree, Vice President of our Director of Affairs and Financial Analysis, and Chief Economist from Property and Casual uh, Casualty Insurance Corporation. Thank you so much for being with us, Grant. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay. I'm assuming everyone can hear me. And uh, at the outset, I don't know the normal culture here. Um, where I used to work, the former, my former boss used to talk about uh, aggressive conversation. So if you have a question and you want to, don't wait to the end, ask them as we go along. Um, <laughs> well, but if you, I'm assuming you have questions and challenges along the way, and stop when you have the, the question and we'll move on. Okay, so I've got basically two parts to this that I was asked to talk about. Well, I was asked to talk about the second part. But in order to make sense of the second part, I need to explain who PASIC is. And um, if you don't know who we are, we did a uh, telephone survey of 1,000 Canadians in, in 2019. And one out of a thousand Canadians knew the name Pasek and knew we existed. Canadians are very sure that they will be protected. They're very proud of their financial services sector. If they're, if you ask them who's going to protect them when their auto home or uh, business insurer goes on, they know somebody will. But they don't know who. That's Pasek's job. Um, we are part of the safety net that looks after Canadians. Uh, we were formed in a uniquely Canadian partnership in 1989 when there was a cluster of insurance failures and the federal government said that they were gonna start a program, a compensation association. And two groups have thought that was a terrible idea. One was the insurance industry and the second was every province in Canada. Under the Constitution, insurance is a provincial matter. So from 18 months from the federal pronouncement that they were going to start a compensation, compensation association, the insurance industry and uh, each province made a deal and they formed PASIC. I'm going to talk about how we work as we go along. But we are provincial, part of every provincial insurance act in Canada requires that if you're an insurer in retail to the public, you must be a member in good standing of the Compensation Association, which is us. We're part of, part of the plumbing of the insurance industry. And uh, if you have purchased a home auto or insurance or uh, home auto or commercial insurance policy in Canada, you get passive protection for free. Uh, we have a formal mission statement, it's in three parts. The first is we protect consumers. And uh, we're part of an international group of things like PASIC, so the uh, International Farm Insurance Guarantee Schemes. Uh, and not all of our compatriots around the world think of themselves as a consumer protection agency. We do. My job is to protect policyholders and Keyword is undue financial impact, financial loss, and the unlikely event that their insurance company goes under. Second part of our mandate is to manage the cost of that for the insurance industry. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. And the third is to maintain confidence. And the thrust of what I'm about to tell you and all the other stuff is firmly within this mission. Protecting consumers if insurance companies go under, managing the cost of that, but most importantly, maintaining confidence in Canada's insurance system is the reason and was one of the, the primary reasons for the research paper that we're about to present. To understand what I'm about to tell you, I need to explain a little bit about how PASIC works. The law that governs what happens when an insurance company fails in Canada was written in the second term of Sir John A. Macdonald's uh, government. 
in 1878, the Winding Up and Restructuring Act. It has been modified slightly since then, but it has an amazing piece of legislation written by Sir John A., who was an insurance man. He helped form Manulife and he helped form Dominion of Canada. He knew insurance. He wrote a really good law. Uh, it still has some fascinating parts where it talks about buggy, buggy whoops and, and uh, horse carriages and stuff, it, but generally it's been untouched because it's not needed to be. Um, when a company goes under, the insurance supervisor, which is mainly the Office of Superintendent Financial Institutions in Ottawa, each province in Canada has their own team of supervisors because an insurance company can be registered federally for solvency regulation and it can be uh, registered provincially. Here in Ontario, where I'm sitting, uh, there are seven provincial insurance regulators, or sorry, there are seven provincial insurance companies that offer insurance in Ontario. Four of those are past members, uh, three are not. When your insurance company goes under, the insurance supervisor makes the call that it goes under. They're the ones, and the law is not, there's not a defined number where if you get a uh, solvency score on a, on a financial test below a certain percentage, the law says that when they lose confidence in your ability as a going concern to keep your promises, they can shut you down. The way they shut you down is they go to the Attorney General of Canada. The Attorney General of Canada goes to federal court, a federal court seeking a winding up order. And this is where it gets a little bit fascinating. The winding up order says generally, uh, all policies of home auto insurance companies cease to exist in 45 days. Consumers have 45 days to find new coverage. All assets of the insurance company are frozen because it's a mess. There's a reason that the regulator has lost confidence. And all checks are frozen. You're not, the insurance company will not allow, be allowed um, to pay any bills until they can sort it out and go to court. So there's a pause. PASIC's job is to provide liquidity in that pause, and we step in to the court system as an inspector to the estate and say, we have cash and we will pay the claims, we will reimburse premiums, and PASIC will give money to consumers in exchange for a piece of paper, and that piece of paper chain, uh, transfers their claim against the estate of the company from the consumer to us. At the end of the process, and the, it takes 15 to 20 years to complete the wind up and closing of an insurance company in Canada, Passage is the largest creditor. I didn't mention where the money comes from, but we don't have a huge pile of cash in your room. I have a bank account with $60 million, which is more than I have personally, but for insurance industry, it's not a lot of money. We have a line of credit for $250 million through the big six banks. But in all of that, we send a bill to the surviving insurance company. So if a company goes under, I send a bill to all the other companies in the insurance industry for whatever it takes to protect consumers up to these limits. So PASIC will pay. So I'm gonna take one step back. When the court points the liquidator, the liquidator will send a letter to every policyholder explaining what's going on. That letter will say, now your insurance policy is canceled in 45 days, stop making payments to your company, do not pay any more premiums, consult a lawyer. Roughly in the history of insurance insolvencies, roughly 100% of people will freak out when they get that letter because everyone will have paid insurance policies. Passing will step in and we're gonna give you any money back that you paid in advance for your premiums. Up to $2,500, and for some stupid rule that I hate, but not been able to change, we give you a 70 a 30% haircut. We give you 70 cents in the dollar of anything that you paid in advance for an insurance company or your coverage. It's become a less uh, important number over time as people have gone to monthly pays, 
debit, it was a much bigger deal when people paid uh, annually. But the math of an insurance company is 100% of the people pay premiums, two to 3% have claims. So if we can get 98% of the people out of the estate as quickly as possible, we maintain confidence and it becomes cheaper. The 3% of people who have claims, PASIC will pay your claims and we provide you the insurance for the next 45 days. We are the, when a company goes under, there are two sources of money in Canada. Source one is reinsurance contracts. There are each reinsurance contract signed by a company has an insolvency clause that maintains the integrity of the legal contract in, through the insolvency process. And that was a PASIC initiative about 10 years ago. And two is us. No one else is going to step up and give the money. So the courts are generally uh, welcome our involvement. When you have when a consumer has a claim, we protect from undue loss. And we have these claim limits. So they vary by policy. If you have uh your personal insurance policy, your home or tenant, we will pay up to $500,000 and you will be fully protected for any claim below that number. We're partially protected for a claim above that number. And I'll tell you the number of those people in a second. For auto and commercial policies, it's 400,000. Again, if you have a car accident and your claim is 399,000, you'll be fully protected. If it's above 400,000, you are partially protected. And that means that the amount above that, you go back into the legal process and you're part of the estate. This, uh, I did a poll, uh, sorry, a survey of PASIC member insurers. Uh, and we had 750,000 claim files. And this is the percent of Canadians that we estimate that would be fully protected by these limits. For auto, it's 97.1%. For homeowners, it's 99% of all insurance claims are below uh, that 500,000, 96% for commercial auto, 94% for commercial. The passive model uh, has worked through 13 insolvencies. Generally, the level of protections are high. Uh, we believe Although CDIC and the banking system uh, won't say it explicitly, in the 2006 review, there was a footnote in the submission to CDIC made to the Department of Finance that gave a percentage, and they said they collect, they're protecting to 97% of Canadian bank accounts. And we feel, as a benchmark, we're in the ballpark. So message number one that I would like for you to take away today is one, there's a system that happens when the companies go under, if your insurance company goes under. Two, uh, I can tell you conclusively, it's worked 13 times. And three, the level of protection we've taken pretty seriously. And we believe for the vast majority of Canadians, we will pay your claims and we'll be there for you. Is there any questions about how the passive protection are working and how it works? Go ahead. So you said that when you uh, uh, when you do on your procedure, you send a bill to the existing uh, insurance company. So yeah, I'm going to talk about that exactly okay. next. Sorry, but I think it's Peter Drucker who said uh, a good question is one I know the answer to. A great question is the next slide. That's a great question. So how does this actually work? So when an insolvency goes happens, each insurance company has signed a contract with PASIC. Each insurance company has a license from each province that they retail in, and that's our hook. So when an insolvency happens, the PASIC model is, I look at the insurers who competed in the same province as that failed insurance company, and I send them a bill for the amount of outstanding claims and my estimate of how much money I need to do unearned premiums. To repeat, repeat everyone's unearned premiums. 
I send a bill to the insurance companies that compete in those markets. They have 60 days to give me their money or they cease to be a member in good standing at PASIC. And I'm allowed to write to the provincial insurance regulators and say they're not. And in theory, they could lose their license to retail in the public. In the history of PASIC, 13 insolvencies. We've had two disputes. And uh, in both cases, they had a point. But in both cases, they lost. And they paid. And specifically, uh, when a normal insurance company goes under, is a slow, slow motion train wreck. You can see it coming. You can see the things going badly. And they do dumb things. Uh, one of the dumb things they do is enter new markets. So there was a small company in 2003 called Markham General, and in their death throes, they entered the province of British Columbia. And this small provincially regulated Ontario company went under, and we sent the bill to British Columbia insurance companies, and they got mad and didn't want to pay, but they had to. I'm only telling you a story illustrate how it works. That, uh, there is a maximum that I'm allowed to bill in any single year, and that's 1.5% of the direct written premiums of the members. And in 2003, that's $1.16 billion. If I get in a bill to the insurance industry, they have to pay within 60 days for up to $1.16 billion. It's there's a lot of liquidity in the system. Um, that's, but there's no limit on the number of years I can do that. So if a company goes under in December, I can send a bill for 1.6 $1 million. January 2nd, when we're all back to work, I can send another bill for 1.16 billion. They each have to pay within 60 days. It is a, in the academic world you guys live in, this is an ex post funding model where all of the money is collected after the bad thing happens. The difference, one of the major differences between us and CDIC is they have their huge billion dollar fund at the beginning that, that they collected over time. Our members and our insurance uh, have kept that relatively small. We have 60 million, they have, they have 6 billion, and then it's going higher. The risks are completely different, but we are an ex post system. Go ahead. Yeah, the risk that actually in academia, this is also, uh, it's becoming quite common to construct insurances where uh, the payment uh, comes after the loss. But my question is, I guess, based on what Robert asked, how do you share the, the cost? Let's say someone- It's based on market share in the, the provinces that fails insured the business. Okay, so it's only a bit based on the market share. Yes. So the biggest company in the market would get the biggest bill, and we share the costs. It's frozen in time the moment the insurer went under. What the market share was at the end the year before that, that's the share you have to pay of the of the insolvency. So if I had five percent uh, in the province of Ontario and five percent in the province of Alberta. Company that went, in, went under did business in both those provinces, I would get 5% bill for the total bill. If the, if the percentages change, your weight of the total bill would change. But I spread it by province, then I go down by market share in the province. That's how the bill is spread. Yeah, I would be curious to you as an actuary. Don't they sort of try to oppose and say you have to do it risk based? I mean, risk contribution based rather than market share based. That has come up. Um, it's uncomfortable for PASIC for two reasons. Number one, to actually say that would mean I'm making a judgment on the solvency of a member company. That's not what we're paid to do. Uh, and two, that's the regulator's job more than me. Uh, so we they have explored risk-based assessment mechanisms, uh, and CDIC has some of that going. Uh, we do not. Um, the second part, and this is a little, little, it's inconsistent with logic with what I just said. 
because this is how it happened after an insolvency happens. We base it only on direct written premiums on the market share completely exposed with no risk waiting at all. However, uh, we do also do a, a separate billing for administrative assessment, which is the cost of my salary, turning the lights on, my computer, the whole, like just the cost of running the place. And that's based on the uh, minimum capital test risk required capital, which is a risk-based measure. And that's okay. That the, our board said that was okay. But when we proposed to use that for assessment, they said, no, they wanted to stay, keep it simple with market share. Okay. I, I do have one question. It's Ruby from CIBC. Sorry, I, I raised my hands before. But um, one question, I'm looking at the website and noticed that there are different um, commercials and business and res residential. So as I uh, work for a CIBC risk management department, I purchase insurance for CIBC to protect CIBC. I'm looking at like commercial property, the valid limit is 400,000. 400, As you probably know that CIBC probably way more than that. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, is this only meaning for focusing on customer level, not on the business size, like our size, or CIBC size? So it's a great question. Uh, I don't have a, actually that's a good question because I don't have a slide on it. Um, the passage model is skewed towards individuals and the $400,000 is a policy. And the logic of that is we're there to protect individuals and that's where we want the bulk of our protection to be. CIBC as a corporation with professional risk managers going with uh, making sophisticated transactions. If your company goes under, you should know and, and you should take the solvency into account. So our protection is there for CIBC specifically, uh, but it only you're only going to get four hundred thousand uh, dollars for a several billion dollar loss. And I'm going to talk about that uh, some of the impact of that a little later. The good news for you is that ninety six percent of the claims uh, related to that on the commercial insurance policies in Canada fall below that threshold. So our, it is not perfect. Uh, we There are lines of insurance between sophisticated uh, insurance purchasers and providers, surety, marine, that are not covered at all by passing. Um, we, our model is skewed towards individuals and small business. Thank you. Probably not the answer you're looking for. So. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm gonna, if I've explained how PASIC works, um, I'm gonna talk about the actual paper that I was asked to talk about. Um, a lot of what I gave you was just the introduction to this paper. So uh, this is the third version of our estimate of how big a bad event Canada's insurance industry could handle. And the driving force of this was my very first board meeting at PASIC. I was asked by the chair of our board, who went on, who was the uh, more stoic, he went on to become the global chair of Aviva. And he asked an unfortunate small question was, is there something that would cause PASIC to fail in its mission? And the answer is yes, there is. And um, the reason I put up the three papers here, because uh, I want to give you a little background. Uh, the first paper I wrote on this topic, Peter and I, uh, was not well received by the insurance industry. And you're talking about risk management. I don't think that my career path and the way we presented this was good career risk management. Because when we presented the results to the board of PASIC, which includes uh, both insurance members and independents. The very first thing they did is brought in uh, Professor Mary Kelly from Laurier and Professor Ann Kleffner from the University of Calgary to review my assumptions, to review everything 
to make sure I wasn't wrong. And I got through that debt. He went through from there and presented to the insurance industry, and they were upset. Uh, they did not like the idea that I had quantified the upper end of the uh, how big something could event they could handle. Uh, and the insurance industry actually hired Deloitte to redo the analysis. And Deloitte confirmed what I'm about to tell you made some sort of sense. Um, they changed assumptions, they challenged the math, uh, but they came to the same conclusion. Uh, then I went to the comp board, or sorry, CD Howe took a run at this. And there's a paper by Nick LePan, which comes to the same conclusion. Anyway, it took five years within the insurance industry. And generally within companies now, the PASIC model I'm going to present is seen to be credible. Uh, there will be challenges to the assumptions, there will be challenges to some of the levels I gave you. But we updated it in 2016 based on feedback. And I came up with similar uh, findings. Uh, not to give the ending, but there are three types of disaster events in Canada. There is a level that Canadian insurers are prepared for. This is small work. It will be horrible, but the insurance industry will do its job. There's a second tier event, which is larger than that, which will be horrible, and it will tax the insurance industry. There will be problems, there will be headlines, and PASIC in particular, I told you that one in 1,000 Canadians knew who we were, more than that will know. We will be in the news. There's a third level that will overwhelm Canada's insurance industry, and that is not an insurance problem, that is a Canada problem. That is a national tragedy that we need to be better prepared for. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But there are three levels of events. And throughout the three papers, um, uh, those three levels have been consistent. All of these are free on our website, um, www.pasic.ca. Uh, it's not the world's greatest website, but you go into research, why insurance fail? You'll find all of these for free. Okay. So I told you what I found. And since 2013, our message has been, this is a problem identification paper. More than anything, I would like to be wrong. I would love for a big event to happen in Canada and the system just work. And one of the most dangerous challenges I have received so far was that Canada has a long history of muddling through these things, which I personally find infuriating. There is a finite capacity to Canada's to a private insurance industry anywhere in the world. The way Canada is designed is that PASIC, there are four people at PASIC, and it works exactly as I described to you. We are the insurer of last resort for catastrophic risk in Canada. That means Canada is uniquely unprepared. Every other country in the world with catastrophic insurance risk, particularly earthquake risk, has a specific partnership between government and the insurance industry to take this risk. Canada doesn't. It puts it all on PASIC. That is wrong. It's not what PASIC was designed to do. It's silly, it will fail, and Canada will be worse off. That's our position on all of this. We need to, the federal government has a role in this. There is, this is different. This is not a bunch of companies who failed to, to uh, manage this risk properly. This is outside of normal course of business. If you want to use the term market failure, at the very top end of disaster, risk, there is a market failure that requires government intervention. Okay. Sorry, it's me again. Um, I'm actually super interested in this topic is uh, because 
bank uh, lending a lot of money and we are trying to uh, formalize our climate risk impacting us as a lender. And we obviously so agree with your comment that Canada is not prepared for any natural hazard. And we identify there is a lot of coverage gap. And I actually will wait for your comment that I agree that is the fundamental systematic failure is many of the other country we research on is um, government will have some kind of a mandatory insurance requirement for certain uh, area for them to buy flood insurance, certain earthquake uh, type of insurance to protect. But in Canada, I think one of the research that we find is what we don't have this and that's causing the protection gap, meaning the economic losses, not uh, way over beyond the insured losses. Um, so I'm actually curious of, is there any pipeline of solution that put push forward that how government will put that as one of the mandate going forward? Okay, you're actually going to the very end. The great, great question, um, just to go through. Uh, I'm gonna talk about mega cats. So floods, yeah. Actually, can I put a pin in your question till a little later and then I'll come back to it, I promise? Yeah, 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 that's thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the paper and the model and the assumption of how I got to where I got to. Um, and some of the premise of this is it's all hands on deck. So every, when, imagine, the easiest uh, part to imagine is British Columbia earthquake. And my favorite Government of Canada website has been taken down because I've talked about it so much. But in Natural Resources Canada, they have an earthquake section. And there used to be a picture, which I found fascinating. I don't know if you can see this online. But the, the Pacific plate is pushing under the North American plate. And it is generally moving at six millimeters a year. And it's been doing that for thousands, or 400 plus years. And at some point, the Cascadia plate, which is the North America part, is gonna pop out. And the line that I think drives home the thought of an earthquake risk is, the tip of Vancouver Island is going to move six feet closer to Japan. Was, was how he described it. And I went, I get that. That's huge. And that's the kind of level that I'm talking about. When you talk to geologists, it's not if that's going to happen, it's when. There will be an earthquake. Uh, that, that we had in Canada, we had two major earthquake zones in the west coast, uh, through Vancouver, Victoria, and then another one that comes right up. Uh, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City. Those are our two biggest earthquake zones. There's some up north if you look at the maps. But those are the two big ones. Um, if one of those things happen, all hands on me. Every dollar in the insurance industry is going to be dedicated to solving that problem. So I define that to be, there is a solvency test called the minimum capital test. And then for you have a branch, which I didn't go into. That is the same thing. So they set a minimum that you need to keep your business open. Um, anything above that goes directly to, to solve that problem. Plus, insurers in Canada have this contingent capital source called reinsurance. All the reinsurance that they can possibly get their hands on will flow into the country. And if it's an earthquake, there's an actual OSFI guideline that requires uh, companies to be ready for a 500 year earthquake, it's called B9. And the companies are allowed to set up dedicated earthquake reserves. Very few of them do because there's no tax benefit. All that money, every money, every pound that they can get their hands on, will go to earthquake. And that's my def definition of capacity. Unfortunately, they don't disclose the amount of insurance, reinsurance they, got, they buy. So, uh, there are two big brokers, each of about 50% of the business. We took them out. Uh, they both told us their total buy, sort of. And I came up with a, a Canada reinsurance number. And 
Some of the publicly traded companies will disclose in their financial statements uh, the amount of reinsurance they purchase and their attachment point. I used those and the rest. I had to make assumptions for the companies that I didn't know about. That is one of the flaws in what I've done. I don't have better information. So that's the pool of cash available. So now I create a financial earthquake. And I just started at 20 billion. I started at 5 billion. Nothing happens to get to around 20. At 20 billion dollars, companies start to fail the minimum capital test. Um, I distributed the losses based on the market share in British Columbia. Because if you're scared about a BC earthquake, you buy reinsurance. And it is a little known insurance fact that all of us should be thankful that they buy reinsurance. Canada buys more reinsurance per for as an industry. Canada's PNC insurance industry buys more reinsurance than anywhere else in the world because of the OSPE guideline and because of BC earthquake risk. But every time there's a flood in Toronto or a storm or fire in British Columbia or in Halifax, we are actually benefiting because most of that cost is being paid by BC homeowners. So I assumed the losses would be to the companies that would had already bought the most reinsurance. In my mind, that made this a little more conservative. So if the reinsurance, if the losses, sorry, I also assume all reinsurance purchase slows under can. There's no fight. Reinsurers are going to pay everywhere in the world, whether it's being a big disaster, reinsurers pay. Um, and they, they send their money in. And I assume that the money is going to flow into Canada as promised. In total, I had $29.5 billion, which is almost two thirds of the equity base of Canada's PNC insurance industry. If claims are uh, by the insurer exceed reinsurance, so re they want to pay you the reinsurance first. If they can't pay by reinsurance, then it erodes their capital which in turn lowers their policy score. And then I need to spend a minute here, and I don't know how many of you actually know about how these uh, solid C regulation system works for PNC insurers in Canada, which I'm sure all of you study this in your nighttime reading. They, are, they, call, they have a test, and uh, in essence, it takes it's a risk-weighted test. So you have a dollar of uh, liabilities, and then they take haircuts on the rest. So if you have, a, if the score is 100, that means after the haircuts, they've increased your liabilities a bit through the test for risk weighting, and they've lowered your assets a little bit through the risk weighting. If it's 100, means you have a dollar in assets for every dollar in liabilities. The minimum score for any company who wants to remain a going concern and not get special regulatory attention is 150%. We have a dollar fifty in assets for every dollar in life. Normally, companies don't want to be anywhere near that threshold, so they have an internal target with the regulator higher than 150, and then they only want to get near those conversations, so they manage their business above whatever their target is with the regulator. So, on the minimum is 150. The average score. I think in the last quarter was like 183. They're, you know, it's higher. It's like 250, sorry, 250. So they're well above the regulatory minimum. In what I in this model, I don't consider them financially distressed until their minimum capital test goes from whatever it is to below 100. If they go below 100, that's my term for financially distressed. So with that, again, feeding this into your heads, that means they have more liabilities than their assets. However, I don't, I went line by line, company by company. I don't fail you when you get below 100. I look, where could you get cash from? So re companies in Canada belong to insurance groups, which means there's a financial holding company and they're related. So if they had access to cash in a group, I took from the group 
to pay the bills from the disaster until the entire financial resources of the group was exhausted and then the whole group fails. If they're part of a, um, uh, sorry, if they're a branch in Canada, one of the deals when you start a branch insurer in Canada is that the global parent pledges up to 10% of the global capital base in case they will send the money to Canada. So every time a branch got in trouble, I would look to the parent, see the global capital base of the company, and I would try and bring as much of that into Canada as I could in order to save them. If I could not identify groups or parents and you're below 100, you're failed. If I could identify that money might flow into the country, you survived until I cranked up the disaster again. And then go back. Part of what makes this terrible is I assume that everybody will follow the rules and normal procedures exactly as we've always done them, which means once you fail, you go into court under the Winding Infrastructure Restructuring Act, the judge will freeze all the assets because it's a mess. There's so many creditors, we don't know who, get which, who can get what percentage. Anyway, it's going to be a disaster, another disaster. So everything's frozen. So what happens then? PASIC steps in. We will make an assessment on surviving insurance companies. And that assessment will be to refund all unearned premiums. So if there's something that happened in British Columbia and that company sold auto insurance in Prince Edward Island, I will protect the drivers in Prince Edward Island. I will pay all catastrophic claims that result from the event. And I have to pay all non-catastrophic claims that are already on the books. Next assumption, we will only pay up to our limit. So that percentages I told you and the 400,000 uh, that for CIBC, that's all that's in the system. That's all you get. There are some carve-outs. Uh, Ontario has a special way to deal with accident benefits when a company goes bankrupt. That's going to work. I don't have to build that, so I carve that out. So then I send the bill to all the companies. They have 60 days to pay, which is a second negative impact on their capital base because it's a capital call. That further reduces their minimum capital test. I look to see who failed there, and I repeat. Stage three, can I get money from parents? Is there anywhere else I can get cash? And then I keep repeating the cycle until everybody dies. That's the approach I used to model how much and how much money is in the Canadian insurance system. And I'm going to move to results. The good news is that Canada's insurance companies are ready or a really big catastrophic event. So the blue line in this chart says there are companies that'll be below 150, which in my definition is not distressed, they survive. The red bar is you're below 100. So there is pain in the insurance, insurance system. It's doing its job and it will do its job. Once we get to 25 billion, the pain starts to get a little more real. At 30 billion, there are financial distress insurers. Just to drive this point home, the biggest, most expensive cat loss ever to incur to Canada's insurance industry was the uh, Fort Mac fires, 3.6 billion. So we're talking six to seven times greater than that. The other thing to note here is PASIC has 170 members. So to have 58 of them uh, below 150%, technically failing the solvency test would be a bad day for us. But generally, the system would work to 30 billion. Second part of that is I make sure I don't do the, the second part where I look at who can be saved and who not saved. So at 30 billion, at 25 billion, the company gets saved. It was in trouble. I found access to extra money. At 30 billion, there are eight distressed, which means that MCT below 100. 
Only one of them failed. At 35, 13, our distress, six failed. And it goes up as you go along. This is where it gets a little hideous. The one company that fails at 30 billion, it fails. The six fail at 35 billion, take down other parts of their group. So now that six becomes 13. So the six failures direct from an earthquake, there are seven secondary failures, just because the hole is so big for the six parts of their group that fail, they take down the whole group. In each of those, PASIC will make an assessment of the insurance industry. For the 30 billion quake, I need a bill for $300 million, which put in some perspective, the biggest bill we've ever sent to Canadians for a failed insurance company is 20 billion. Uh, this is this would be huge, uh, but doable. We have the money to do this. At 35 billion, we need 6.7 billion dollars, which is two times Fort Mac, which in in the end would be a second major disaster after the earthquake, and that's enough. Uh, that causes cascading failures. It causes more companies to fail, which goes back into the system. And that's where I drew the line. So we would cause at 35 billion, 13 small additional PASIC members who survive the earthquake would not survive the PASIC assessment for the earthquake. So as PASIC and me, that's where I drew the line of that's what we're ready for. And this, I told you at the beginning, there were three levels of earthquakes, catastrophes, 30 billion. Canada's earthquakes, Canada's insurance industry can survive a natural disaster event of up to 30 billion, which, and this should be the headline, is amazing. It's a big number. They're ready for a lot. May she get credit for that, which goes back to, this is not companies not managing the risk correctly, this is something they're just too big. Between 30 and 35, this is where I spent all of my time at Fancy, trying to fix the yellow or, or orange here, depending on your colors. I think Fancy should do a better job in that area, and I can tell you what we're doing to fix that, but that's where I spend all of my time making sure that this, this is going to be better. Above 35, I'm sorry, that's not my job. That is a national emergency, which requires a different kind of response. At $35 billion event, that's only the insured losses. That's an $80 billion earthquake, which is roughly one in every 750 years. That would cause a major economic hit to Canada, and it requires a public policy response. I do want to go back, um, I think it was Ruby who made the, the comment about uh, floods and coverage gaps and all that 1000% true. So um, I have another group of slides on Quebec and then I have some slides on what we could do about it. But I do want to take a minute here to talk about this. Is, there is a public policy response coming here um, and fortunately for me, so there are two types of major natural disasters going on here. In this, I cannot identify, sorry, I don't care the cause of the disaster or the, the event here. And in the initial paper in 2013 that everyone, none of the insurance century liked, I included a section that said, oh, there are only three main things that could cause a number this big. Earthquake, asteroid hit, um, electrical failure of the electrical system. And anyone who wanted to discredit the paper called it the idiotic um, asteroid paper. He told me I was predicting an asteroid hitting the Earth. And they did, like, it just, that's how they got rid of me. 
The second paper, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, I said, okay, I don't care what the event is. This is how much money is there. So in honesty, I cannot identify a flood that causes losses up to this threshold. There are only, I would now add fourth to my list of things that can cause a loss this big. Number one is earthquake. Number two, you are, um, I, no one knows this, but in every single policy sold in Canada, you are insured for space debris. Something flies in the front, if an airline engine falls on your house, you're covered. If an asteroid goes, and the Russian asteroid that went through the, um, the city that's on the same longitude as Edmonton about 10 years ago, that happened in Canada, it's covered. There are models that say an asteroid hit in, in a major city could cause this level of damage. Uh, the second, the third area is electrical outlets. Uh, the big power outage if, uh, from 20 years ago or whatever that was, uh, that can cause losses on this scale. And the next, the fourth one that's new on the list would be a cyber event could cause losses on this scale. Those are the only four causes that I found that can cause a, um, an event of this magnitude. Second part that Ruby mentioned is coverage gaps and flood. And those are very real public policy issues. And we have been working with the Department of Finance and Public Safety, and this is my message, 30 billion. We need to get an event bigger than 35 billion. It causes systemic risk, terrible for Canada. No one's seen this happen, but the government of Canada through the DFAA program, where they pay for natural disasters, they see floods. They are paying floods. Insurance industry is paying flood claims. So the group that is looking at earthquakes is also looking at floods. And in the 2017 budget, federal budget, uh, earthquake was identified as something that needs to be fixed. And there's a team in finance Canada looking at it. The 2022 budget said that the government of Canada is developing a flood insurance program, which is amazing. Canada needs a flood insurance program. So they're actually creating a reinsurer for the federal government that will provide um, flood coverage for people in high risk flood zones so they can get insurance and be protected. That is a very different public policy question than earthquake. In the 2022 budget, where they talk about flood, there is a throwaway sentence that says, and we'll think about it. So to, to go back to, to Ruby, it is a really good public policy. And I'm very happy to tell you that Canada will have a national flood insurance program identified and funded, I'm assuming this is good, in the next federal budget. That is good public policy and it is good for Canada. It does not solve this problem. And quite frankly, I'm majorly disappointed that they did flood first. Uh, personally, again, really good public policy. I'm glad they're doing flood. Earthquake is not being addressed and it remains a major concern of the past. That's very great news. Good to find out. Um, one of the questions that I have is, uh, maybe you already answered through your slide, is the economic risk, sorry, economic losses versus insured losses. Is mm -hmm. this model based on all the insurer that collect premium or the all the losses could possible hit Canada? Because, um, yeah. I only deal with insured losses, which is roughly uh, one third of the cost. Right. So but then that, that event is roughly an $80 billion event. Yeah. 
Okay. One in 750 earthquake um, in British Columbia. Below that, we should be okay. We should muddle through. Um, so in the paper, I do the exact same thing for Quebec, and I'm just going to quickly go through Quebec, not to be disrespectful to people of Quebec, just to, anyway, there are, the market is different. It is more concentrated in a few large players. So the smaller players can fail, and it doesn't matter as much. But as soon as in Quebec, you get one big player to fail, the, the exact same uh, kind of event happens. So there's distressed insurers. At 30 billion, one goes under. 35 billion, a whole bunch go under. The number of the passing assessment goes from 200 million to 15 billion because we're just dealing with one national huge entity that fails at 35 billion. And therefore, the line in Quebec is the same. The amount of money in the Canadian insurance industry is national, not provincial. The payouts are provincial, the, the dynamics are slightly different, but my number was the same. And I just wanted to go back. Um, oh, okay, I forgot about these ones, but uh, I've done this three times now, and my green zone has gone up. So the amount that we've actually been insurers are ready for went from 20 billion in 2013 to 20, uh, 30 billion in 2022. And that's because they're buying more reinsurance. Um, one of the results, I told you the insurance industry did not like my paper in 2013. One of the things they didn't like is that the federal government and their earthquake guideline changed the rules and made them put away more money for a bigger earthquake. Um, they had to buy more reinsurance, and the model shows that they bought more reinsurance. Uh, they bought, they used to buy, first time I did this, they bought uh, 17.6 billion in reinsurance, and that's gone up to 29 and a half. In 2022, that number uh, has stopped growing. So uh, there was a major adjustment in the reinsurance market globally over the past two years, primarily because they're paying out tons of money for flood and smaller events. Uh, the price of reinsurance has gone up by a lot, and the amount of money flowing to Canada has not grown as it did over this six year period. My orange zone has gone up a lot. So passing is ready. Uh, the, the level of preparedness overall, where we would muddle, has gone up. But the red level has not gone up as much. It was 30 billion when I first did this, 35 billion in the last two. There is a level of catastrophic loss simply too big. It, it was called tipping point, and this is the tipping point where the system breaks. Okay, and how am I on time? Okay, so in the intervening papers, I kept getting questions and challenges about, well, why would PASA get involved? Like you know you can't solve this problem. And you know it's public policy. So you just not cover earthquakes. You just, just refuse to help. And what happens? So there's a justification for that. And in the 1989 agreement with the federal government, um, there's something called, it's not really called the circuit breaker clause, but that's what finance Canada. Um, one of the, this is an aside, but uh, I was at a meeting talking with its finance to finance officials. And the senior finance official is sitting across the table from me back when we actually had meetings in person. And he had his pile of paper. And then as he was leaving, he kind of knocked the top of his paper and he had a slide deck. And the slide deck was called the passing problem. So I felt I was make, making progress because one, they knew who we were, and two, they had them slides. Uh, but part of the, the question in that paper was that the federal government didn't believe that ASIC should get it. Like, why would, there's this thing called the circuit breaker where if I know and I can prove to my board that passing involvement will cause harm, then PASIC shouldn't get involved. Um, so I modeled it. We caused financial difficulties for the rest of the insurance industry. 
What if we just stopped and said, not our problem. We will stop. However, in the model, that does not stop contagion. It just moves it up. That moves the red from 35 billion to 40 billion because there's still an earthquake too big for the money. That means that policyholders at the failed companies are just in the court system. They're waiting for the court system to decide and unfreeze the assets, see that they get paid. So there would be like a 12 to 18 month period where no money flowed to anybody. That's clearly not optimal for Canada as we try and recover from a natural disaster. And the second part is you lose a huge part of the market where these companies are gone. And I estimated the number of Canadians who have an insurance policy at the companies who failed. So at 35 billion, I have 1.9 million policies that just ce ceased to have coverage and they need to find someone else. And again, I'm gonna go back to all the other companies are in trouble and not looking to grow. So you're gonna have a massive affordability and availability problem in all parts of Canada because the insurance industry would be a mess. At 40 billion, it's 4.3 billion. And at 45, it's third of the country. It's not instantly better. It doesn't make the problem goes away. Uh, it'll make the hate mail and the newspaper story go past think about why they collected your money and refused to help rather than the system is stupid. It doesn't truly solve the problem. Anyway, there's the market share of the share the insurers that fail. Anyway, I didn't think that was a valid or a public policy response that we should be working towards. Second question uh, was, what if we collected a prefund and we did not make the assessment on members and we didn't cause the second earthquake? How big a pile of money do we need? So it goes back to okay, um, how much money would we need to pay the claims of those failed insurers? And for 30 billion, I had 60 million in the bank. And if we had 200, we'd be ready for 30 billion. 210, actually. And uh, it's roughly uh, two, two to two, 1.7 to 200, 170 to 200 million for British Columbia, or for Quebec, sorry, at 30 billion. And I have 35 becomes $4.5 billion in uh, British Columbia and $12.5 billion in Quebec. So the entire capital base of all public of non life insurance in Canada is $60 billion. So for us to collect a huge share of that capital base in a non performing Refund generally doesn't make sense. Having said that, I can tell you now that since we wrote this paper in 2020, I have, uh, we have, sorry, it's very arrogant of me. We have had PASIC um, gone to a line of credit with all six Canadian banks. And we, if you add that plus our pre funds, we now have access to 310 billion in liquidity. That we can provide to the system and we can be ready for the 30 billion claim. 35 billion is still up. Again, having a huge prefund didn't solve this problem. The next one, uh, regulators wouldn't actually do that. There would be a degree of forbearance where they would just let the companies essentially run a Ponzi scheme where you have a failed company, but as long as they have new premiums coming in and they use the new premiums to pay the, the old claims, you can keep a company going for quite a while, actually. You're not actually dead until you're liquid and insolvent. So what if we just let uh, regulators not close a company at 100? What if we let them go to zero? Well, in the model, this is, I called this the Princess Bride response. I don't know if anybody else has seen the movie. Um, in the movie, the hero gets injured and they think he's dead. 
So they take him to Miracle Max and they put him on the table and he looks at them. He said, oh, he's not dead. He's only nearly dead. And you're not dead until you're really dead. So the companies that fail in this model are really dead. So they have minimum capital scores. Um, sorry, for British Columbia at 35 billion, you have five insurers with negative MCTs. The average of those negative MCTs is 1,137.9. That means for every dollar of assets, they have $113.80 in liabilities. They are really dead. They're not nearly dead. They're really gone. There's a huge hole. It's not like you can revive them. They're gone. So regulatory forbearance of the companies that were really impacted by earthquake is not going to get us where we need to go. And there's not enough room to muddle as we would normally think. Again, that did not appear to be the silver bullet. Um, it does make the problem a little better. And the regulatory forbearance reduces the amount of that I need to collect because some of the Failed insurers don't fail. If you have a positive MCT, you don't fail. In particular, in Quebec at 35 billion, instead of needing 12.7 billion, I only need four. It's better. It doesn't solve the problem. Oh, sorry, that was pretty strong. Here's Quebec. The next question was uh, PASIC has always had. This gets into nuances in the world of solvency regulation and regulation. But there's a term called resolution. And resolution uh, provides it's a whole toolkit that regulators can use to help a company exit the market in a way that benefits consumers. It includes uh, working with them to find a buyer and, and help with a merger. It involves um, uh, taking part of the assets and selling books of business, good, good banks and bad banks, good insurers, bad insurers, providing capital injections. PASIC has a number of those powers that we've never used. What did we get? Can I resolve some of these companies? Um, for the past three years, we have been working with our industry and with governments to, to actually document and how would PASIC use industry money to resolve and ensure. I now have some, I have something, um, we worked with each regulator and we have a intervention guide, which documents information flows that will tell us at each stage in the regulatory process. Uh, we have something called a regulatory protocol, which is when we are allowed to go to the industry and use their money to save a company. And what if we did something different? We just didn't liquidate. That's what this slide says. Doesn't make a difference. And it goes back again to my Princess Pride. When they're really dead, there's nothing to do. Because the hole is so big, you can't just pretend that you can uh, do something different, except pay, find a way to pay the money or not pay those claims. So again, it's the exact same impact as regulatory forbearance. It doesn't, it lessens the degree of the problem. It helps, particularly in the orange, it is not an answer to the red. Canada has a public policy problem. It lessens the amount PASIC has to require, still causes contagion. That's what these slides show. The final thing we asked about uh, what if there was a backstop? And instead of Pass it going to the insurance industry for money. What if we went to the federal government and we got we borrowed money from them? So instead of having causing the second earthquake, how much would we actually need? And this chart um, at each level of earthquake, which are the rows, that's the amount of money that I would need in order to. There are two different, I gave a range here which is return the capital base of the insurer to 150% MCT. Get them back to minimum. 
And then the third column is, what if we paid all the CAD claims from a loan from the government and then repaid it over time? How much will we need? And these numbers are materially smaller than liquidating the company. And I want to stress why. The why is I don't need to pay uh, Ontario auto claims. I don't need to pay PEI claims. I only have to pay enough to, to unfreeze all of the assets in the system. If I get them back to 150, the courts can unfreeze the assets and they can use what's existing in the company to pay the bills and some of those claims. That's the, the rationale between, for the first column of capital injection to get them back to 150. Or if you take away the CAC claims, these were well-run, profitable companies with capital that had a massive event that was more than they prepared for. If we only paid the CAC claims and let them handle everything else, the bill would only be the disaster. And again, that is so much cheaper than having to liquidate all these companies. It's also faster because it takes 20 years to run up in the door and stuff like that. And this seems like a much better approach to solving the top vendors quickers. Yeah, uh, key findings. We're ready for a really big natural disaster up to 30 billion. Seven times bigger than anything we've seen in Canada. Um, to me, that is evidence of good risk management and solvency within this insurance industry. Uh, three, I threw them some flowers because that is actually 10. Their level of preparedness is 33% higher than it was when they first did the paper in 2013. They bought 71% more reinsurance. Companies are managing this risk. Um, after 30 billion, companies start to fail. We'd be strained, but we would manage. Above 35, is the industry is overwhelmed. Um, inaction by PASIC would, could cause hardship for millions of policyholders and lead to re reduced availability in all of Canada. Anyway, above a certain plot size, there are some solutions, increasing our pre-fund, attempting to resolve uh, distressed insurers instead of liquidating regulatory programs. We are working on each of those things. That does not solve the red problem. And then finally, a CAD event above 35 billion creates a national crisis for Canada. It's not an insurance crisis, it's a Canada crisis. This is where um, my four Canada scientists. If you go on to Earth, you go home and you Google earthquakes in Canada, and you go on the Geological Survey of Canada. I would like you, if you do that, I would actually encourage you to you take a break from football later today, American football. Look at the verbs they use. They're not using might, will. They're using will. Inevitable. The words they use, earthquake will happen in Canada. We're not ready. Uh, solar storm could cause that much damage. Space debris and cyber. Again, uh, people who, especially within the insurance industry, who wanted to make discount the PASIC paper, uh, that's it was the Earth, the asteroid study. And then number 11. Uh, Canada can and must become better prepared for this. We have looked everywhere else in the world. And if I would actually encourage you to ask these kind of questions, the US has a program. They have the California Earthquake Authority, they have a national flood insurance program, they have hurricane programs. The UK has a flood insurance program. They don't have earthquake risk. Um, Spain has a program. France has a program. Japan has a program. Chile has a program. Mexico has a program. You name me a country that has an earthquake risk, and I can show you a program where there is a partnership at the top end between the insurance industry and government. It's not an insurance problem. 
It is a problem of geography, and that's where we built our country and our homes. So uh, our position has been unchanged since 2013. There's a finite capacity. It is not uh, PASIC. Was not designed to be Canada's earthquake insurer of last resort. If we are called upon to become Canada's earthquake insurer of last resort, I didn't mention this before, but the staff complement of PASIC is four. We are not, our budget is uh, roughly 1.5 million. We are designed that we can scale up. There's no way we could scale up. We would fail miserably in our mission to protect consumers from something of that size. We've never dealt with a multiple uh, insurers failing in a year, and we've never done anything bigger than 20 million. The system will fail. Uh, our nation needs, our nation actually needs and deserves better. Finance Canada is working on it. Public calls, again, I'm going to go back to, uh, I, I mentioned this earlier with Ruby's question, but there is a group at Finance Canada working on this. They're choosing to dump blood first because that is the more urgent problem. There is cash going out the door. It is not the most important problem in my mind. It's real. Having a flood insurance program will make Canada a better place. I don't want to miss on, be misquoted on that. But there's no flood that we know of that will cause the failure of Canada's insurance industry. There is an earthquake. Okay, so questions. And uh, all of our stuff is available on the PASIC website. Um, to give a slightly different plug, uh, we just released a study on the Lancashire's Fail where I documented. Uh, 547 insurance companies have failed across the world in 55 different countries. That's 2,000. Um, we haven't had one in Canada since 2003. So yeah, we are trying to be helpful and to make sure the system works as we go forward. And hopefully, if you ever get a phone call from a polling agency that ask name of the place that protects you if you're an auto a home or business insurer goes on under, maybe you can remember things. That's it. Or is open to questions? Then uh, over time. <laughs> I apologize. No, 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 that's okay. So I think that uh, this is, you need to have lunch before. You would have two very short questions. I will just stay silent. Any questions from our attendees? I have a lot of questions, but I, I, I just want to be uh, conscious of time. Uh, I did hopefully that we can connect more information in the future. Thank you very much. I really, really think the presentation today is very insightful. It's actually bring my brain a little bit of brain damage today. So I make sure that I would do do more. One of the um the number ten is the earthquake, solar storm, space space debris, and uh, cyber. Cyber is not uh too popular for customer as the um, customer level to buy company consider buying buying. So as I don't know how the calculation that would trigger that thirty five billion coverage concern because it's not one of the popular uh, coverage. Just one of the questions I have. If cyber is the consideration, I would also think that um, terrorism would be considered too. Uh, like um, in the state, they have triage that you know is a pool of, comp pool of fund that prevent just in case there is such a thing. So I kind of want to understand that as we are looking at the insurable loss, how this bring down the PNC industry, um, but cyber is not one of the popular coverage. Then if cyber is included, then I would say that maybe terrorism is also considered. But that's just uh, one of the questions that I will go back because it is a lot of information. I probably 
uh, might not be able to think through it. But I thank you very much. I really appreciate your presentation. It was very insightful, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. Thank you so much, Grant, for the very interesting presentation. I think we're going to go into Google, you know, global uh, earthquake preparedness now. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for your time, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us.